Okay, today on the show, we have a couple of movies you might not have ever heard of. First is 2022's Fresh, and then we have 2019's Plus One. Both are available on Hulu. All right, everyone, welcome to Brandon at Random Reviews. I am your host, Brandon Griffiths. Thank you for tuning in. I do appreciate it. Today on the show, I mentioned uh, we've got some movies that I actually happened to just stumble upon and decide to watch, and I figured they were worth doing an episode over. So we'll get to those in a minute, but, you know, of course, I got these warm-up topics that uh, I like to do. So uh, first things first, you know, I had my... Thor Love and Thunder episode, and it was an underwhelming movie. I wasn't a big fan of it. I could have done without going to see it in theaters, to be completely frank, because I also heard shortly after it came out that it was supposed to be on Disney Plus in like three weeks. So I I just, it was a big letdown. I mean, I hadn't liked the Thor Ragnarok movie either, which a lot of people really liked, but I'm hearing more and more people tell me that they felt the same way I did about Thor Love and Thunder. And I've noticed that that's kind of a problem with the Marvel movies. You know, there are a lot of recent ones that have come out that have been underwhelming and not anything special. And they're starting to lean more on the humor. And it. I guess what I hate most about the, the humor thing is that it's the type of humor it is. It's, it's jokes that only get made in action movies as comic relief they're not really funny moments or anything so it's it's just it ends up being kind of shitty you know what I mean I don't I don't really care for that style of humor and to have it because they use it so much more than the average action movie uses it to do comic relief I just I get tired of it but I mean Doctor Strange that was a disappointment I mean the multiverse of madness Doctor Strange and it, I think the biggest problem with that one was it was hyped up to be this huge crossover movie. We thought that it was going to mean that, you know, they were going to bring all of these 20th Century Fox-owned characters into the uh, the fold, you know? And they just didn't really... I mean, they, they did some of that, but it was, it was not as grandiose as they might have led you to believe by, uh, you know, the, the promotions for the movie. And I think that they planted a lot of that stuff, and I also think that they cut a lot of that stuff out of the final, final cut of the movie. So I, I wasn't a big fan of that. I definitely liked it better than Thor Love and Thunder. You know, I, I just, and I've gotten to where I'm a little less apprehensive to share with people that I'm not a fan of some of these movies because they're just, they're just not that good. You know what I mean? And it's like when I came out of Thor uh, Love and Thunder, I I was very confident in saying I didn't like it. But with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, I came out, I went and saw that with multiple people and I basically just said straight up, I was like, yeah, I didn't really like that. I didn't really think that was very good. Like, it, the the hard thing is, is it was, it was not a bad movie. It was just, it didn't deliver on what the expectations were. And I don't think it would have taken that much more to, to close that gap, but they didn't do that. So that's kind of what we ended up getting. So, I mean, I, I was starting to notice this in the Marvel movies before Endgame even hit. So it was, it was already starting to be a problem. And they just kind of left it, you know, they, they're continuing on the same course. And I don't think Disney is quite realizing that these movies are not up to snuff, you know? It's just, it's a cry and shame because they've been so successful for so long and they've done such a good job with them that it's like for them to just all of a sudden, now that they're like not recognizing that like, hey, this isn't what we want in a movie, I, I just don't know. I don't know what to think of it. So I have a couple of weddings to go to this summer, this fall. Yeah, I think it's this fall, really. First one is my stepsisters. And so, you know, like I have very little involvement with that wedding. You know, I just, I'm just going to be going to the actual, you know, probably the ceremony and the reception. I mean, the only thing you could ask for that would be 
more ideal in a wedding is if you don't even have to go to the ceremony and you you just go to the reception and say congratulations and you stay for the amount of time you want to and then you leave. Uh, but with this one, I am going, it's, it's somewhere like northeast of Fenton. I can never remember. I want to say maybe it was like Oxford, Michigan or something. And I ended up having to reserve a hotel for that night because... It's far enough away and I kind of want to drink, you know, I'd like to, you know, get a little rambunctious or whatever. And if I don't get a hotel, I'm going to regret it. So I figured I might as well just do it right now and be done with it. So I, uh, I have that one. And then I have my friend's sister's wedding in October and her wedding, I I'm going to like a couple's shower, which I guess I didn't realize this was a thing now, but it's it's a couple's shower and it's it's right in Grand Ledge where I live. And it is a, you know, it'll be just like a little afternoon evening type thing where I, I go there, I bring a present, whatever, and I just go, you know what I mean? And But the thing is, is then for their actual wedding, it's in Ludington in October, and I assume I'll probably, like, work out, like, getting a hotel room or whatever. I don't know how that's going to work. I probably should be working on that right now, but it's so difficult, like, trying to figure out, like, okay, so this is where the, the wedding is going to be. This is an acceptable hotel room to stay in, blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, just... It's uh, I, I'm it's getting me a little unnerved, honestly. I mean, I'm just it worries me having to make plans like this, and you know, like I have to for the other wedding that I'm getting a hotel for, I have to call that hotel and confirm the reservation because I already called and did the reservation. It's just I I'm that anxious about stuff. I have to confirm those kinds of things because otherwise it'll freak me the fuck out. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for those weddings, though. I'm, I'm excited to go to them. The only thing that I think would make them a little better is, you know, if I actually knew more people that were going to be at them, you know? If, if there were more mutual friends and I just... <sighs> I mean, that's the only, the only hang up I have is it'd be nice to know more people, but I'm, you know, I'm still excited. It, it could be fun. I mean, I don't, I don't even know if I'm allowed a plus one, but I don't, I don't think I would be able to cash in on that anyway, because of who I am as a person. And that brings me to my next topic, which I, I've been rewatching the show Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Jerry Seinfeld. And, you know, the basic, if you've never seen the show, the basic premise is Jerry Seinfeld will get this, this rare older vehicle and he will, he will come and pick somebody, you know, like a celebrity up and they'll go to get coffee together and they'll just, you know, talk about whatever comes up and whatever they feel like. And he was doing this episode with Steve Martin, who is, you know, one of, the all-time comedy greats. Just, I fucking love Steve Martin. He's such a great guy. If you ever get a chance, go to YouTube and search Steve Martin, Tom Hanks, Lifetime Achievement Award, or what, you know, just, probably just Steve Martin, Tom Hanks, and watch him do the speech before presenting Tom Hanks with the award for, you know, Lifetime Achievement. And it is some of the best comedy I, it's, it's just hysterical and he Steve Martin is perfect at it I just I fucking love him and so the the episode of comedians in cars getting coffee you know Steve Martin was talking about how you know he used to have trouble getting up on stage and doing that stuff and then you know somebody gave him the old standby fucking advice of hey you know if you just if you just pretend to be confident you know you'll get there right and Jerry Seinfeld, I was, I was, I had never liked Jerry Seinfeld more, and I love Jerry Seinfeld, but I had never liked him more than when he said, but, but pretending to have confidence and having confidence, there, there is no difference. If you, if you can pretend to be confident, you are confident. That's, that's how that works, you know? And I'm like, yes, Jerry Seinfeld, thank you very fucking much, you know? I guess, um, uh, I should probably get to these movies. Uh, first up is a movie called Fresh, which came out in 
2022 on March 4th, to be exact. It was billed as a comedy horror film, but it wasn't ever terribly funny. I'll just say that up front. I I guess it was a little funny in the beginning of the movie, but for the most part, I would not call this a comedy horror movie. So if you go into it expecting, like, laugh-out-loud hysterics or something, temper your expectations, okay? So the director of the movie is named Mimi Cave. She has no Wikipedia page. Enough said. Lauren Kahn wrote the movie. No Wikipedia page. Producer. Now this is one. All right. Producer Adam McKay. If you're not familiar, Adam McKay has been involved in such movies as Anchorman, Talladega Nights, Step Brothers, The Other Guys, The Campaign. As you can see, there is a Will Ferrell trend here. Uh, Anchorman 2, Get Hard, Don't Look Up, and... He was also, uh, he also uh, produced Vice, and I mean, he, he directed other movies that he didn't produce, but these are just movies he produced, and, but I loved The Big Short, and he was uh, an executive producer, I think, and he was director on The Big Short, and I, I, I cannot recommend that movie enough, and I need to see the movie Vice. I, I've decided that I'm going to watch that if I can find it on streaming sometime. I'm definitely going to check it out. The composer for the score is named Alex Summers. No notable prior movies. Okay. So the star of this movie is Daisy Edgar Jones. And she plays the character Noah. And there there are very few movies that she's in or shows even. Uh, She was in a show called Normal People that I'm not familiar with. She was also in, uh, or she's going to be in the movie Where the Crawdads Sing, which actually by the time I release this, it will have already come out. So she was in Where the Crawdads Sing. And she was in a show called Under the Banner of Heaven. And that's that's all I could really find that were were like notable shows or movies for her. So, you know, I mean, she's obviously not a huge name. Uh, Sebastian Stan is her co-star. He plays the character of Steve, and I should probably tell you right now, I'm I'm probably going to have to spoil these movies today, so please just bear with me. If you want to see these movies, I'll tell you that I I enjoyed both of them enough that I, I think you wouldn't be too disappointed if you watched them. They're both on Hulu. They're both, they're both really solid movies, but they're, I I just, the way I'm going to talk about them, I'm going to have to fucking spoil. So, you know, enough said. Sebastian Stan plays the character of Steve. You probably know him as Bucky Barnes slash the Winter Soldier in the Marvel movies. He's in a bunch of Marvel movies. Uh, he's, and I think he's pretty good. He, he doesn't have to do a whole lot of acting, I don't feel like, but other than that, I mean, it's, he's pretty solid. He was also in, I think it's the show Pam and Tommy, which is on Hulu. It's about, you know, Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee and their their life or whatever. He's in a movie that I watched on Netflix. I don't know if it's a Netflix movie or not, but it's called The Devil All the Time. It has like Tom Holland in it and a couple other like notable actors, like good actors. And it was fucking like watching paint dry it was so fucking slow I couldn't stand it I I just I couldn't believe I I didn't even finish the movie it was that fucking slow I never like I'll, I'll make I'll I'll point out right now I am not the kind of person that gives up on a movie very easily you know I don't if I'm bored with a movie I will still press on and see if it's worth it you know, I, I usually won't give up on it too quick. Uh, he was in I, Tanya, which I love. I love I, Tanya. He was in Logan Lucky, which I forgot he was even in that movie. Honestly, couldn't even tell you who he played in that movie. But I love Logan Lucky also. And he was in a movie quite a long time ago called The Covenant, which was about male witches. And I know what you're thinking. Aren't those called, like, warlocks? Or, you know, if you're in the Harry Potter world, they're, like, wizards, you know? Nope, they're just male witches on this movie. So it it was basically like a fucking teen movie where it was just like all these, you know, young, good looking guys that were, you know, it was appealing to a certain group of people. And that was it. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like it was targeting my demographic. So 
I can't really fault it for, for not being good to me, but, you know. Uh, so someone named Jojo T. Gibbs is in this movie. She plays Molly, and she is not in any movies I've ever heard of in my life, and I, I have to, you know, accept that that's kind of the way these movies are today, is they've got a lot of people, aside from Sebastian Stan, that there's not much notable, you know, stuff in their filmographies. So, so this is my, I, I try and, I'm trying to write a plot synopsis for all of these movies that I do now, and it's like, I, I do, like, I, I understand that it's a struggle if you're a person who writes the, the plot synopsis. Like, it's, it's not easy to just come up with something on the fly, and, like, I assume a lot of the people that write the synopsis have never seen the movie before, so it's even harder, but, um, I, I said it was a woman with bad luck in the date, in modern dating meets someone randomly at a grocery store. And that was like when I was trying to be spoiler free. So it obviously, you know, it's a horror movie, so it gets a lot more dark than that. But just to say like that, that's basically what I'm talking about is like, it's the original, you know, first act of this movie is about a woman who's struggling to find somebody in the dating world. And, you know, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, the first scene, she goes on a date with this guy and he is just super douchey. You know, he, he tells her before she comes that they only take cash at the restaurant and that, you know, basically he's implying that she needs to pay her own way. And I, you know, I'm of two minds in the subject. Like, I, I think that, you know, I, splitting the bill for a first date should not be that big of a deal. You know, I think that that should probably be the norm. But it just, the guy goes about it in such a douchey way. And when she's talking to him, you know, and, and like, she doesn't really like the food. And she's paying for it. And like, he he makes a comment like basically, oh, well, you know, then I'll just take your leftovers. I've got my brother coming into town or whatever. And I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll just leave a little extra for the tip and you can leave a little less and, and we'll call it even that sound good. And so it's like, she leaves this date and she's just like, the guy is still acting like he's got a chance with her because like people are that delusional. And I know that. But, like, he, he goes for, like, he's about to go for a kiss, and she's, like, and, and, and he's talking about, like, another date or whatever, and she's basically like, God, no, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to go on another date with you. It's just not, I don't feel a connection here or whatever. And it, it was, I mean, it was a funny bit. Like, it was a funny couple of minutes to open the movie with to see, you know, so it was like, that's where they get the comedy from is to call it comedy horror, I guess, is, I think, a stretch, but you know, whatever. Um, it, it did feel my, my experience with online dating especially has not been good. And I, I would say that for women that it's kind of a double-edged sword. Like they get, they, I, I think women have a lot more to choose from than guys do. But I think that, you know, the average woman is probably having a worse experience with online dating because it's such a creepy situation to be in. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, you never know if you can trust the guys like that. That's what I basically said in this movie is it's just like, it would suck so bad. I mean, to be a woman at any time, it would, it would be so unnerving and I can't even fucking imagine what it's like. And it's like, they, I don't know how they go out in public and how they go on dates with men they've never met in their life and how they do any of that stuff, it's it's just bizarre to me, you know what I mean? Like, because they have so much to be concerned about, you know what I mean? So she goes, you know, after, after this bad date she has, she goes and she's, at some point, I don't know how far down the road it is, but she, she goes to this grocery store and she's like in the produce section and Sebastian Stan is there as Steve, you know, and she's, she's Noah, she's, uh, it's, Noah in the, the produce section and Sebastian Stan starts like talking to her and like, you know, just kind of clearly trying to break the ice and, you know, he's just being cool or whatever. And he, you know, he gets her number and then they, uh, 
it's weird to me because I've never seen Sebastian Stan. Like, I didn't watch the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show, but, like, I've never seen Sebastian Stan show this kind of range where he's, like, this charming, talkative guy where he can actually, like, pick up women. It's ridiculous, but, like, she, so they're, like, chatting each other up and, like, she, I mean, she clearly, like, they, they, they show that she's, like, pretty miserable with her dating life and she just fucking hates it and she just, you know, wishes things could go a little better and I'm, like, I'm right there with you. I fucking get it. So she goes on the date with, with Steve, you know, and Steve seems like he's a really good guy. And obviously, you know, it's, it's got to have a plot. So, you know, Steve can't really be all as good as he's cracked up to be. And he's just, they're, they're chatting and they, you know, they end up like, you know, getting physical, they end up kissing. She goes home with him. They have sex, you know, all this shit. And like, she's, you know, kind of like letting her guard down and she thinks that Steve is, you know, a good a good guy. And it's like, they basically, you know, they, they start getting really close. And at some point, like, I, I wasn't really, I was a little fuzzy on the timeline. Maybe I, like, missed something. But I, I couldn't tell how long they had really been together. And basically, oh, I, I do want to mention something. Okay, so there's a quote that she says while she's on the date with Steve. And she says, we put all our hopes in, like, finding happiness through someone else. And I just think that, like, I don't know, maybe it's not meant for me because I've been alone so long. I'm actually pretty good at it, you know? And I'm like, holy shit, that's fucking accurate. But, you know, she ends up going home with him and all that shit. And she, um, uh, and they're planning a trip, you know? They're planning to go away for the weekend. And, you know, so it's like, it's already, you're starting, you know, you're, uh, your scary radar is starting to go off. You know, like this is, you know that this is not good, that she's going on this trip with him alone and she hasn't known him that long. You know, there's just a lot of red flags there, but she's doing it anyway. And she starts, you know, they, he has to delay the, uh, you know, how long, like when they can go and all this stuff. There's just all this extra added, you know, concerning things that are happening, you know, and like, it's just, you, you really are starting to wonder what's up. And I, I, I really didn't, you know, I knew, I knew not to like this, this delay in the, the departure of the trip, you know, I, I didn't like it at all. I, I did notice at that point that she looks like somebody, she, she looks really familiar and I couldn't, th and I was like, I got to figure out what she's in. And so I looked to her IMDb page and she wasn't really in anything that I knew. And then I looked at the, uh, oh, I, I looked like, I looked at her and I was like, okay, she looks like somebody, but I don't think she is that somebody. And I realized she kind of sort of resembles uh, Rebecca Hall from The Town with Ben Affleck and... I liked that movie. It was pretty solid. And she just kind of vaguely resembled her. And I guess I decided that that was enough for me to think that it might be her. And so, you know, every, with every moment going, you know, as soon as they leave on this trip, every moment that passes, Bucky, I'm sorry, Steve, Sebastian Stan, I, I'm sorry if I call him Bucky or whatever, he's... He's getting creepier and he's getting a little weirder and things that he's saying just aren't adding up, you know? She doesn't have, uh, <laughs> I remember thinking, like, she didn't have cell service, rut row, you know, like, you just, you know, it's, if they, if they call attention to that, that it's gotta be a problem. But I kept marveling because this movie was taking, taking some chances with their cinematography and it was really cool to look at. It was a really well shot movie. It was it was certainly more interesting to watch. And I mean, the whole reason I watched this movie was because I saw this post by a, a movie page that I follow on Facebook, and they were talking about how there's all of this uh, there's all of these new horror movies out this year that are really popular. You know, like The Black Phone is one I want to see, but I've been hearing mixed things about it. But this movie was on that list, and that was what spurred me to watch it, because everybody was saying, oh, Black Phone's not that great, you should watch Fresh, you know? Anyway, they get 
to whatever this, you know, this cabin in the woods. He makes her a drink, and you're like, I mean, there's no way this drink isn't drugged. And sure enough, it's fucking drugged. And she, you know, she's been drinking it, and all of a sudden she just kind of collapses. And it's at that point that the credits start. Like, the intro opening credits to this movie and the title card show up are 33 minutes into this fucking movie. I cannot fucking believe how long it took for it to happen. I I had just assumed, you know, because a lot of movies these days aren't doing opening credits. They're doing like a an end credits and then they're doing, you know, second credits, you know, like a, another wave of credits to include with those. And so, you know, it was just, it was like, it kind of, I, I, at this point I'm thinking it's not, it's not like I'm liking the movie so far. It's, it's got a little bit of predictability that I'm not loving, but it's, it's also hard to be unpredictable and in, in horror, especially. And I mean, the only way, I mean, what I really was hoping was that I wouldn't have seen anything about this movie. I wish I wouldn't have known it was a horror movie. I wish I, but, but you can only shelter yourself from so much information you know, and if you're me, you're trying to keep yourself in the dark about everything, but you can only do so much, like I said. I said that it was the longest pre credit sequence in a movie I'd ever seen, and the 33 minutes, it was confirmed by IMDb, it was like super fucking long. I, I went to look up Adam McKay, because I saw him in the credits, and I was, I was giddy about it, and I just came across a picture of Jennifer Lawrence in the movie Don't Look Up, which is directed and produced by Adam McKay, and her hair in that movie is so terrible, I just... It looks insane. I don't know where the fuck they thought of it. She says, I don't remember at what point, if it was before she gets drugged or right after. Oh, that's right. No, I think it's when she's... So after he drugs her, she wakes up and she is chained to the floor in this little bedroom thing. You know, she's got like a a thing around her wrist that's keeping her chained to the floor And she says, what's going on, Steve? And he says, I, I'm going to tell you, but you're going to freak out. And it's like, at this point, it's revealed in this movie. And I'm telling you, spoiler, 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 spoiler. He tells her that he has basically kidnapped her and he is going to harvest her meat to sell on the black market. Okay? Okay. So, I mean, it's it's that level of fucked up, right? And so you're like, holy shit. I had that that plot point spoiled for me because the the poster that they ch- they chose to use on that Facebook post was, you know, it was it was like one of those like styrofoam trays that's wrapped in cellophane that they, you know, pack meat in in grocery stores and stuff. It was like a human hand in that kind of like wrapped in cellophane in a styrofoam tray and it said fresh on the label. And so that was that was how I knew already like, oh, OK, so that's going to be what this movie's about. And it kind of pissed me off a little bit because it's like, don't fucking give that away. Like you're clearly trying to keep people in the dark, like the way you're you're doing this storytelling in this movie it's just aggravating to me. Like, don't fucking reveal that much shit with your mo- movie poster. I get that you want it to be a clever, cool movie poster, which it was. And if if I saw that after the fact, I would have been like, oh yeah, that's pretty fucking good. But now it's like, fuck, it's, it spoiled that for me. You know what I mean? I knew, I knew that this movie was going to go south and I knew it wasn't going to just be about her struggles with dating and things like that. She finds out pretty quickly that Noah does. She finds out that there's another girl there. And, you know, he's obviously doing this to multiple women. And he's got, like, several rooms in this place that, you know, he's taking them. And he is keeping their meat fresh. And, you know, that's the whole title of the movie. And it's, I mean, it's pretty interesting. But so it's like I was thinking as I'm looking at him. So obviously people find Sebastian Stan good looking. I don't have any doubt about that in my mind, but like he just, he seemed creepy in this movie. And maybe it's just, it was me projecting that on him because I knew something that I shouldn't have known. 
But so so this okay so from the very beginning of this movie they they have this this friend of Noah's and she's you know they're always talking to each other she calls her before dates or after dates or whatever and this friend realizes something's up because you know she's going you know her friend Noah's going on this trip and this friend's name is Molly so that'll be a little easier for me to explain this but Molly realizes that Noah is going on this trip with Steve. She doesn't trust the whole situation. And so she, once she realizes that she's not hearing back from Noah, she starts to investigate and try and find out where Noah went. And um, eventually she hears back from Noah and she gets like a picture and she searches for the picture on Google and finds out that, hey, this fucking picture is being used on a website and this is not the pic- a picture that she took, you know? And so she starts investigating and she gets somehow like, she figures out where Steve lives and goes and starts talking to the woman who is there. And she's basically like figured it the fuck out pretty fucking quickly, right? And she's been talking to this, this ex of hers that, you know, she's like keeping him in the loop on what's going on. And basically like she, she tells the woman at, at Steve's house that she thinks that he's run away with, with this, you know, Noah and taken her somewhere and done something to her. And, um, Steve ends up coming home while Molly is, is there. And she's like asking him stuff. And she, you know, they, they, they call him by another name, like they, like he's going by Steve to Noah, but like this wife knows him as Brandon or Brendan or something like that. And it's just like, she, Molly is like, you know, dead set on figuring out if this guy is up to something, you know? And so she actually calls Noah's phone and she finds, you know, like the phone starts ringing in Steve's bag. And so that's how she figures it out but the wife is in on it and they fucking take molly and they fucking have her under you know you know they they take her to the little cabin and all that shit and it's like holy fucking shit like i cannot fucking believe that it just went down that quickly honestly like realistically nothing should have ever fucking happened so anyway There is, there's like this slow burn in progress once molly gets captured and and Noah doesn't even know that Molly got captured, right? And all the while, Molly's ex is, like, trying to figure out where the fuck she is, and he's getting worried and all this stuff. And so Noah is starting to, like, try and manipulate Steve, you know, because Steve is there, and he keeps, like, doing stuff with her. It's like he's into her or something, you know what I mean? And so she keeps continuing to do what he wants her to do, and she acts like she's really into it. And, you know, like, you know that she's doing something. You know, she's not just doing this for funsies, you know. And so I always think of this this quote from the Adam West Batman, uh, the, the 1966 movie. He says to, you know, the, the penguin uh, played by Burgess Meredith is dressed up as another guy, but it's very obviously the penguin dressed up as another guy. And, you know, Batman asks him, what's your game, penguin? And I always think of that whenever I feel like somebody's up to something, I think, what's your game, penguin? And that's, that's what I'm like, I'm interested. I'm like, I'm watching the movie and I'm like, I feel like this is, this is not something that this Steve guy would fall for at all. Like that was my big gripe. Like I, I enjoyed this movie a lot. I'll, I'll spoil that right now. But I will say that one thing I didn't really care for was, like, Steve seemed like he was pretty gullible, you know? He was a little too willing to believe. And even if he wasn't, if he was playing along, that's, it's still, like, he let it get too far. And he, he let his guard down too much if he, if he knew it was coming. There, so there is a scene where, basically, because at some point she has... Like, he he cuts the meat out of her ass. I don't remember if he, like, put implants in her ass or something. But, like, if you had that happen, it would be painful to fucking sit anywhere. And so, anyway, they're, you know, they're dancing together. They're flirting. And then they, like, are going to have sex. And she, oh, man, it is 
I mean, it makes you cringe every time. I don't care who you are, but one of your fears should definitely be if you're a guy. She gives, she goes to give him a blowjob, and like she kind of flares her teeth just before she does, and she clearly is supposed to have like bitten into his dick. Then she like you know makes a break for it, and she ends up like getting the other girls out of there and. You know, she, but, but he's still coming and like, she keeps, her and the other girls keep not fucking killing this guy. You know what I mean? Like if you, you would, you would spend, if you're me, you'd spend an hour making sure that dude is dead before you fucking do another damn thing. You know, you don't, you don't go fucking running. You don't go trying to figure out how to, how to get home. You fucking make sure that that guy is dead and that no one is coming to to capture you, you know? I mean, that's that's what I would say anyway. It, it gets a little cliched with, you know, them running from him in that way. They don't they don't kill him like they should initially, and then, you know, they just carry on. But I mean it's I, I really did like I like what they did with this movie. It it had a, like a, a good vibe to it where it was like it was like a slow burn type movie where they didn't really reveal what, what it was all about. Uh, it seemed like a lot of a lot of the interactions in the movie were really like well written and very well acted. You know, they they seem they seem genuine. You know what I mean? It, it was honestly pretty fucking terrifying to think that this totally could fucking happen to somebody, anybody, especially women. You know, if if they could go on a date with this guy and trust him, and he could do this to them. You know what I mean? That's fucking horrifying, and that's a good thing to make a horror movie out of. The, I think that the the two leads of this movie, if their if their performances weren't so good, you know, if uh, Noah and Steve, you know, if they if they weren't so good in this movie, uh, it, it would not be as good of a movie as it is. But I, it, they elevate the movie to a level that that I wouldn't otherwise have expected it to get to just based on what I knew about the movie. The only thing I, I, I wish is like I mentioned, I, I wish I could have seen nothing about this movie and just watched it without any advanced knowledge of what's going on. Um, some of the things were a little predictable. So, you know, some of the things were a little unrealistic. I, I don't think that Sebastian Stan's character would have been that naive or that trusting of a girl that was, that had, literally nothing to lose, you know. Writer Lauren Kahn, who I mentioned does not have a Wikipedia page, she was a horror fan growing up, but she wanted to write a story that was for both horror fans and non-horror fans, which I think I could see that. Like, it, it, I think ultimately you still probably are going to want to be a horror fan to truly enjoy this movie, but I, I get what she was going for. IMDb trivia, so I always try and find at least one shitty piece of trivia if there's any the the piece i saw that was the most terrible was steve tells noah that he does not eat animals he is not lying if he considers humans to be more than animals that's not trivia that is not trivia at all stop fucking doing this imdb users please stop runtime of the movie was 114 minutes budget was Somewhere between 15 and 20 million dollars. Worldwide gross, there was no uh, no real data on that on Wikipedia. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to dig that far to find that information. And it could be because it's mostly, you know, it's a Hulu. I don't know if it's a, a Hulu made movie, but it's it might have only been on streaming. I don't even know if it got a theatrical release or anything. And so there's there's just no info on how much money it made. Uh, it has an IMDb rating of 6.7, a Rotten Tomato critic score of 81%, Rotten Tomato audience score of 80%. My own personal rating is 4.5 out of 5 stars. I, I mean, like, I think this could potentially be one that I would watch around Halloween every year or every other year or something like that, you know, because... It's not the same as Christmas for me where I keep watching the same Christmas movies every year. There are a select few horror movies that I can actually watch that are, you know, ones I want to see every fucking year, you know. So moving on to the movie Plus One, which was released on June 14th, 2019. It's currently available on the streaming service Hulu. It was directed by Jeff Chan and 
Andrew Reimer. Neither of them have Wikipedia pages, which is always nifty when I have watched a movie and I try and not like figure out anything about the movie. And I, I like go to look up a bunch of information to like talk about. And then I find out that there's fucking nothing on any of these people. Um, those two guys also wrote the movie. So no, no additional information on other things they wrote. Executive producer Ben Stiller. That's a name. I mean, that's somebody that, that you know about. And I'm sure that, that that's partially why I actually, you know, you, you know about this movie. You know what I mean? Like, or, or like I should say, you can find it. Because if you've got Ben Stiller backing it, it's at least got some credibility. The, the composer of this movie was named Leo Byronberg. And never heard of him. Doesn't have any notable movies. Um, he's... He's, I should say, he's been on, like, he's, he's assisted in other scores, but none that he were, or none that he was the outright composer on, so. So, actually, top build in this movie, which I was really surprised to see, because she hasn't been in jack shit else, is Maya Erskine. Maya Erskine. She is playing the character of Alice. Uh, she is not the main character of this this movie, this story, that she's just not. She's she's in the Hulu show Pen15, which if you look at it, looks like penis. Terrific. She's not really in much else at all. But the other, you know, her co-star, who is second build in this movie, is Jack Quaid, who is the son of actor Dennis Quaid and also nephew of Randy Quaid by, you know, extended logic. He he plays the character Ben. He was in a couple of the Hunger Games movies in a very small role. It was like his first ever role. He's in that show, The Boys, on Amazon. And I really need to check that show out because I've heard a lot of people say good things about it and I need to see if it's any good. Uh, he was in something called Vinyl, which is, a, I think, a show on HBO. Uh, he was in that Scream 5 movie that's just called Scream because I fucking hate people who decide movie names, especially horror movies. He was also in Logan Lucky, and I don't fucking remember him from that movie at all. He's gonna be in the movie Oppenheimer, which is a Christopher Nolan movie that's coming up, and I'm, I'm excited to see that, but I'm I'm apprehensive about getting too excited about it because I was not a big fan of Tenet or Dunkirk. My plot synopsis for this movie is... Two unlucky in love friends agree to be each other's dates for a handful of upcoming weddings. Solid, okay? I feel like that's, it's not revealing too much, but it's giving you a little primer. But I mean, honestly, like plus one, I mean, aside from like elementary math, you're only really hearing plus one on wedding invitations. So the movie starts off and like, there's something that carries on throughout this movie that I think it's it's a really awesome idea which is like, you know, they've got like 10 fucking weddings to go to. You know, the two of these, these two characters, um, Alice and Ben, they start off with Ben is going to give a best man speech and he's explaining, like he's, he's saying what he's going to say to her, to Alice and they're just friends, right? And so he's explaining to her, you know, what the speech is going to be. And she's like making fun of him and telling him it's fucking terrible. And it sounds pretty fucking terrible. And then they switch over to the actual, you know, where he's giving the speech at the wedding. You know, it's it's kind of a cool juxtaposition. And he he's like finishing it up. And like the little bit that you do hear him say at the speech sounds like it also would have been terrible, but it like goes over really well. So, you know, Alice takes credit for helping write the speech or whatever. And it's just, I, I can't help but feel like that both speeches would have been terrible, but whatever. Like as I'm watching the movie, you know, I was thinking, I, I don't feel like Alice is like a good leading lady because honestly, I I only saw the the poster for this movie, I, you know, it's just first glance, like she seemed normal looking, right? But she's just, she's not like terrifically, like not even like really cute, honestly. Like that, I, and I don't mean to be a dick. I, I, mean, I realize I'm not a raving beauty or something, but as far as, you know, leading lady material, same with leading men material, generally they're all nice looking people. And I guess it's kind of nice to get a little change from that. So I'll shut up. But 
I feel like maybe neither of them were that good looking, but like Ben has the tall guy thing going on where I feel like a lot of people, a lot of people that are into men just seem to think that tall men are just attractive or just more attractive. I don't get it, but I, I don't have to. He looks like, and this is, this is how I would explain it. He looks like he would play Andrew Garfield's brother or maybe just like childhood friend or college roommate or something like that you know like that's that's the kind of look he has to me if you look him up you know if you look up Jack Quaid you'll you might agree with me I don't know there's a girl in the first wedding that Ben is trying to to hook up with and she should have been the lead in this movie like as far as like looks are concerned like she probably could have been considered but obviously wasn't you know, she, he basically finds out that she's engaged. Like, he goes to kiss her, and he hasn't noticed the whole time that she has a an engagement ring on, which I, I get it. Like, I never fucking notice these things. But, of course, I never get far enough to be, like, making the move on a kiss that, you know, I would I would need to worry about it. It's basically just more upsetting after the fact, you know, to figure out that they were, they were, they were already engaged. So... I think one of the one of the gripes I would say I have about this movie is so this Alice character, you know, she's she's top build in this movie, right? She is she starts off the movie being kind of funny, and I assumed she was like a comedian of some sort, you know. I assumed that that was just I had never heard of her, and she was just in this movie, but she she's not she's not a comedian she's just an actress slash writer and she she starts off by making all these jokes and being funny but then you know it's like she's broken up with her boyfriend and she's you know getting drunk at this first wedding and she's just fucking shit-faced and obnoxious and she's not very likable you know what i mean she's not somebody i'm rooting for to to have a good time with. I, I put this like, so she, she starts crying and I put, there's a quote from Archer where he says, no, don't. You're so ugly when you cry. And it's, it honestly fits so fucking well because my God, not good. I assumed like, I, I, I knew what this movie was going to be just based on the title. I was like, okay, plus one, these two are going to be friends that and I'll mention now it's, it's spoiler filled. There's going to be spoilers for this fucking movie. Get the fuck over it. I assumed these two friends were, you know, going to be friends. And they were agreeing to be plus ones to the, to a bunch of weddings that they had to go to. And then I, I just knew they were going to end up, you know, together. You know, that that's like the only way this movie can go. Right. And it seems like such a shitty idea. I mean, unless you legitimately know that you're not into somebody or something like that i i can't imagine agreeing to be in in that situation i, I put okay so basically what i put in an acknowledgement of what this movie was about i put be my date this is what they have to be thinking be my date to the weddings that are coming up that we have to go to maybe you'll meet someone Someone who thinks you and I are already romantically involved. That's exactly the problem with this fucking movie. Ed Begley Jr. is in this movie. He's, I don't know if you know who he is, but I know him from Arrested Development. And, you know, he plays Stan Sitwell, who has alopecia. And he has, you know, like, he's got to put, like, fake hair on and fake eyebrows and stuff. But uh, he's he's not bad in this movie as Ben's dad. But wh what people don't, like, you can just tell when somebody writes a scene at a golf course and they they don't play golf and they don't know anything about golf. He says he, he's going to hit his ball, you know, Ed, Beg Ed Begley Jr. is going to hit his ball out of a bunker. And he says beforehand, get ready for the magic and hits it. And no one fucking does that. I'm sorry. No one, no one hypes themselves up before hitting a golf shot, especially not in that situation. Sorry. Does not happen. They also, they don't pull the pin when they're on the putting green. Like they are clearly like 10 feet from the hole and they go to putt and they miss 
And it's like, yeah, but even if you would have made that, it's you're supposed to fucking pull the pin, you know? This movie posits a world where this Ben guy has seven fucking weddings to go to, and Alice has four. And I, I was relieved because they did a pretty solid version of, you know, just a brief overview of, like, each wedding. You know, they didn't dive too deep, you know? On a select few pivotal wedding, you know, opportunities, they, like... They went a little more in depth with them, but for the most part, they didn't do too bad. They're riding on this bus and they're singing Semi-Charmed Life by Third Eye Blind, but it's it seems very clear that they none of them are actually mouthing the words. Like none of them are actually saying what's you know what the lyrics are to that song. So all I can think is like maybe they did a song and figured out it was wrong. And then they re-recorded it and, you know, like, did it in a studio and, you know, transposed that onto the fucking scene in the bus. But anyway, I, I put at this point in my notes, there is no way Ben and Alice don't end up together. Alice says, this, act this is actually a great idea. And I said, it's really not. The cheaper hotels notion is the most sound, though. Like, the, the fact that they could split hotels when they... If they have mutual weddings, it would it would be a lot better for them. You know what I mean? They're sleeping. This is before any any of you know any of the hooking up might happen or whatever. They're sleeping in the same bed, but they're not supposedly romantically interested in each other. And she keeps like suggesting that they cuddle, and she also suggests that cuddling could be precluded from any kind of romanticness. It's just not true. You you cannot do that. You can't put two platonic friends together in a bed and they're cuddling and it means nothing. I, I don't give a shit. I'm not cuddling with anybody that I am not romantically interested in. And I, I can fucking bet you that because I'm also not cuddling with people that I am romantically interested in because, you know, that's just, them's the breaks, you know? That's, that's the way it goes. I mean, I said that if you're if you're in the same bed, if you're gonna cuddle, you might as well just fuck. You might as well just have sex. Just fucking do it. Whatever. I I don't I didn't even do this on purpose, but after I said all this stuff about them cuddling, I said there is no way Ben and Alice don't end up together again. I said it again, and I didn't even mean to. I said that she must be a comedian. She is not. Ben knows that Alice is sitting there, like, with this potential hookup of his, like, you know, like, she's, so she's sitting at a lounge chair at a pool, and there are these two other women, and one of them is pregnant, and the other one seems like a viable candidate for, you know, hooking up with Ben. And Ben is in the pool, and he knows these women are there, and he is, like, like, spraying pool water out of his mouth and, like, kicking his legs up, like... They just, they paint him in the most unattractive light. And this, this woman is saying that she's like into him and she'd, she'd be interested in him. You know, this is what she says to Alice. And it's like, okay, that's, I, I don't understand that, but all right. I, I'm glad that they, they took, you know, they took the time that, you know, all these weddings, there's so many of them, but they're brief. They don't, then they put a little spin, but they keep that same best man or maid of honor speech in each of the, the wedding scenes, you know? So it's like, it kind of has this connective tissue type thing that I love so much. I said that if if she is a comedian in real life, I'm not eager to hear one of her sets, which is, yeah. The guy, they go to this hotel, okay? So they're, you know, they're just, it's a continuous tour of these weddings. There's very little downtime between the weddings. There's like a couple of scenes here and there. Nothing major. They go to one hotel and the guy behind the counter says to them, your total is 8353 or whatever he says, plus resort tax. Why would you say the word total if you didn't mean it? You know what I mean? If if it's if it's this amount plus tax, then guess what? That's not the total. The total is the total. The total is the amount with tax. Uh, I would say in this movie, Ben and Alice's, their chemistry, their dynamic is is very good. It actually like, they it does feel like they are friends and that they could be 
romantically involved with one another. But I, I said I liked them, and and it's really nice that they have that dynamic because they're totally going to end up together. But hey, you know, like you also get Ben's dad and you know his new stepmom are basically talking about how much they love Alice, and I'm like, at this point, I would so much rather it not turn out that they're going to end up together. I just don't fucking want it at all. I can't fucking deal with it. I don't know. You know, that's that's the way that is. I mean, they're they're pushing for it so much, but it's like, I really, really wish they could have set it up to not fucking happen at all. The, the romantic tension is like so high in this movie. It's it's just, there was no way it wasn't going to lead to it at this point. You know, they, they keep having scenes where they're just building this tension. So there's there's a moment where, okay, so like after one of the weddings, they are kind of getting flirty with each other. And they go to this like cemetery, right? And she says something about needing to hold your breath to run through a cemetery because of ghosts or whatever stupid thing she believes. And then when she, you know, she holds her breath and she does that thing that people do sometimes when they hold their breath where they like balloon out their cheeks. And I never really understand that. Like you're really not getting additional air, you know, not enough to say so. They go into the cemetery. Oh, and they stumble and fall. And oh, look, they're going to start kissing. Okay, that's kind of nice. Oh, look, they're going to start fucking. Oh, okay. Um, great. And then they, they end up staying. They, they like fall asleep after the sex. Cause I think they're probably drunk. I can't remember for sure. And when they wake up in the morning, they're still laying in the fucking cemetery. And this groundskeeper walks up to them and just starts saying, cooters out, cooters out. And lo and behold, they are literally like laying there and her dress is pulled up and her vagina is, I mean, you don't see anything, but you know, that's the, the implication of, of what he says. So it's like, okay, I, I guess I, I mean, I enjoy the fact that, that Alice is not like a typical female lead. She's not just, but I, I feel like that's been done to death too. Like the, the atypical female lead, atypical male lead, whatever her parents uh, Alice's parents, when they meet Ben, the mom is like really aggressive and is like, what took you so long? You know, basically just giving him a bunch of shit. Cause at this point they're like, Alice and Ben are dating. And it's like, would you not be that person that fucking, you know, is giving people a bunch of shit for that? You know, I mean, they don't need to be, you don't need to, to hassle them about it. They're together now. There's nothing you can do to fix it, you know? the I mean, the dad even says at some point that, I'm really glad you came along, Ben. I haven't seen my daughter happy like this in a long time or something like that. And it's like, yeah, no pressure whatsoever, Ben. So there's a scene like they've, they've been dating. Everything seems to be going well. He's, Ben's writing this, this card for the couple at the wedding that they're going to next and they go to leave and he asks Alice where the gift is and she's like oh shit I forgot it and they get in this big fight about it and it's like she you know it's like he has a, an argument you know he, he he has a case against her for why she should have remembered the gift, but at the same time, it's like, fuck, dude, you're not going to do anything about it now, so just get the fuck over it and move on with your life, you know? Because he's, like, talking about how much classier it is to walk up with a gift in hand and stuff, and I'm like, yeah, but in reality, they're not going to fucking open those gifts right away, and you could mail it to them and say, hey, sorry, you know, we left it behind, we didn't realize it until it was too late and we didn't want to miss the wedding, and that would be it. You know what I mean? I mean, it would not be a big deal. The The fight, it's so aggressive. Like, it's so annoying. And it's, I get that it's supposed to be uncomfortable. Like, that's what a fight is like. But I, I just, I could not fucking stand it. It was, it was not pleasant. It was not, I don't know. One of my biggest gripes with this movie especially is like, okay, they do the thing like, like she was in the beginning. She was pretending, you know, or I should, should say, it's, Alice was drunk. So you've got an actress pretending to be drunk. And she's just being obnoxious. And she's not really acting the way I feel like a lot of drunk people act. But whatever. 
And then we get this scene with Ben's dad where, you know, his dad is, he his dad, his dad took a bunch of acid with all of his friends for like a bachelor party thing for, because the dad's getting married. And it's like, what are you fucking doing? And like, that's all I can think is like, I hate watching movies where a person is pretending to be on drugs. You know what I mean? I hated it in... I think it was called Long Shot with uh, Charlize Theron and or Charlize Theron and Seth Rogen. I fucking hate it. It's like a standby of Seth Rogen movies that he loves to have people who are not traditionally people that would do drugs. You know, he likes to have them do drugs and basically have to act normal while they're really high. And he just thinks that's like, that's like the funniest fucking thing in the world. And I I don't. I don't enjoy it. I don't believe because this movie suggests that the that Ben's dad has been married twice before and this is going to be his third marriage and they still have like a full-blown ceremony and reception and I'm like I don't know many people that are on their third wedding. I don't know many people that are on their second wedding. You know what I mean? Unless one of the two people involved in the wedding has never had a wedding before. That's the only thing I could imagine. But it's just, I, I just don't, I, they, they suggest that this guy is going to have this fucking expensive ass wedding with a woman that presumably has been married herself before. So it's like, no. Um, I would say as far as this movie's concerned, you know, that the two leads are, they have great chemistry. That's, it's a big, big plus. Uh, the, the writing is actually pretty solid. It's a, a little overdone but what can you do it, it does feel real I, I liked the way that they kept changing up how they did the weddings and it didn't feel like repetitive it, it, it put a pretty decent spin on on what most of us has already seen before the only thing I will say is there are like way too many common comedy movie tropes like as I mentioned actors pretending to be drunk or on drugs uh I guess they just in the end of this movie they basically just conveniently get back together for the last five minutes, like, cause they break up, they have this fight, they break up and all of a sudden they just, things just have to work out. So they just fucking work out. And I don't, I don't care for that. I wish it would have like been that it ended up that he learned a lesson and she, she could have even ended up like single at the end and still been you know, learning a lesson herself, you know, that would be much better. This movie had a runtime of 98 minutes. Budget was unknown. Worldwide gross was $44,112. So not super great. IMDb rating was 6.6 .6 and the Rotten Tomato critic score was 88%. The Rotten Tomato audience score was 79%. And my personal rating for this film 3.5 out of 5 stars. I originally put 4, but as I was talking through all of these issues, I realized that I just didn't like it as much as I thought I originally did. So there's that. It's not a bad one. It's I wouldn't necessarily suggest it, but I would I would say you won't like hate yourself for checking it out. Uh, that's, that's all I got for today. Um, uh, I, I guess, you know, send me your suggestions. Don't be a stranger, you know, don't worry. Um, if you suggest something, I might not do it, but I might also possibly do it. So I hope you, uh, send some ideas my way and I can use them. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Brandon at Random Reviews is performed, written, directed, produced, and edited by Brandon Griffiths. Theme music is performed by Augusto Diniz from Fiverr. 